Okay, folks, welcome back to the Hoplite channel. I'm your host. Uh, appreciate you coming back. Um, right now, we are in the middle of the uh, Samurai Lit series. Um, I have uh, concluded the Primer series, and now we're beginning uh, the source material, and we're going to start with uh, Takuan Soho. This is part one of Takuan Soho, and um, he will be the first... Uh, person we cover in this samurai literature series. Uh, but he himself was not a samurai. Uh, he was actually um, a Zen Buddhist monk. And I thought it was um, wise to begin with him because before going into the writings of actual samurai, we'd be better served perhaps going into the works of a Zen Buddhist monk and uh, what Zen Buddhism uh, instructed as far as philosophy and how uh, Takawan Soho uh, was able to uh, give advice to his friend, Yagyu Mununori, who we'll cover later, who was a samurai, and how Zen Buddhism had a profound impact on Bushido and the warrior's way in feudal Japan. Uh, so this, primary, this series will deal primarily with Zen Buddhism and its impact on Bushido and how those samurai... Uh, use the teachings of both uh, to live their lives uh, in the warrior class. But we'll begin with a brief bio of Takawan uh, uh, right now. So he was born Takawan Soho, and he was born in 1573 in Izushi, which is in the province of Tajima in Japan. Uh, Izushi is actually a, a famous village uh, in Japan. It's ancient. Uh, I think it goes back... Um, centuries and centuries. So it's probably one of the more um, uh, historic villages in antiquity in Japan. And that's where Takuan was born. Uh, he died in 1645 in Edo, which is today modern day Tokyo in Japan. Uh, so he lived a pretty good life considering uh, his, his, um, his era. Uh, and uh, he, he lived a life of simplicity uh, as a Zen monk and um, the, the reputation he carried in life was he had a very uh, sharp wit. Uh, he, was, he was kind to those who were friendly to him, but he definitely did not mince words. He was very direct, and some people considered him uh, maybe standoffish in some regard, but uh, for those who knew him, that was just his way. But uh, as I said, he was a Zen Buddhist monk, but he was also a painter, a poet, a tea master, which was a thing, uh, in feudal Japan, I guess, master of teas. Uh, and he was a gardener and a calligrapher as well. So he, he, uh, he was not one to shy away from the arts, especially uh, the finer arts, painting, poetry, gardening. Uh, if he did, you know, bonsai gardening, uh, calligraphy, which was, the, you know, the drawing of the kanji as an art form. Uh, so he had uh, many talents. Uh, he uh, was a student of the Rinzai uh, school of Japanese Buddhism. And there were three uh, schools of Buddhism in Japan at the time. It was, there was Rinzai, Soto, and uh, Obaku. So what were the uh, teachings of the Rinzai school uh, of, of Buddhism? And uh, they broke down into three categories that a uh, Zen monk who was in this school would dedicate uh, his, his life and his daily routine to. And number one was uh, zazen, and that is simply meditation, primarily seated meditation. So when you see the Buddha with his legs crossed and his eyes closed, this is the Zen state of seated meditation. It's reflection, it is tuning out the world and becoming more in tune with your inner thoughts, with your, um, your, your spirit and uh, cl cleansing your mind of the distractions that may pollute it. Uh, and secondly, there is a practice of uh, koan. And koan is um, using the, uh, the methods of storytelling, of proverbs, of dialogue to uh, question things. And that is, uh, as you'll see in the readings, that is central to Zen Buddhism, uh, and especially to Takawan Soho, was to question everything uh, as it is perceived in the world, that there is no truth but the constant questioning of what is truth. Uh, everything we know, everything we see, everything we're taught, everything we hear, or everything we're told 
is a version of a truth, but is it actual truth? So you must always question things. And this practice of koan is um, that uh, is that practice of, of the question. And this, is, I think, is where he got his reputation as being somewhat standoffish or perhaps direct in that he would often question everything uh, that he saw or heard and would uh, relate it back to Zen Buddhism. And uh, this practice, for somebody who's not familiar with this brand of philosophy, can seem uh, probably a bit um, uh, annoying. But uh, lastly, you have Samu, and this is thoughtful labor. So, you know, the Zen monk uh, would take upon labor as a means of reflecting upon uh, life and the questions of life and uh, this was its own form of zazen meditation and you could see he did this with painting with poetry with preparing of tea with gardening with being a calligrapher these were labors arts uh, activities where he could um, perform uh, duties uh, but also uh, use them as frames of reference for thoughtful reflection when he wasn't in seated meditation okay now what about uh, you know, Takawan the person. Well, uh, he is well known to be advisor and friend to many nobles in feudal Japan. He was uh, a, a contemporary of many samurai, and he was also a friend with one of the, uh, I believe, shoguns in the Tokugawa shogunate. But don't quote me on that. But I do know he was uh, well regarded by the nobility, the shogun, the samurai class especially. And in particular, as I mentioned before, uh, a samurai by the name of Yagyu Munanori. Uh, who we'll get to later in the series, actually in part two of the, uh, the Samurai Literature series, will cover you, uh, Munanori's uh, contribution in The Life-Giving Sword. But um, uh, Yagyu and Takawan were uh, good friends, and they communicated regularly, they corresponded. And Yagyu actually uh, requested his friend Takawan um, perhaps lend him some advice on how he should uh, approach the martial arts with a better mind, with clear judgment, and uh, Takawan obliged his friend and wrote him uh, several works in the unfettered mind, which we're going to read here uh, in a second. Uh, I have it right here. So the unfettered mind was uh, a collection of works, and it's very short. Uh, I definitely recommend picking it up. It is easily uh, less than 110 pages, but uh, the, the, it is calorie rich. It's very calorie dense. Uh, it's 110 pages, but... Uh, in, incredibly valuable to understand the Zen Buddhist mind and it, it definitely uh, leaves the reader uh, like asking for more which I think was, was the, the purpose of it and he wrote this, uh, Takawan wrote this for um, uh, Yagyu and they are divided into uh, three separate chapters or books and the first part which we'll read from here in a moment uh, is number one, Immovable Wisdom a uh, clear sound of the jewels and the annals of the sword to eye. And the uh, first part, which is immovable wisdom, I, in my opinion, is probably the most important part of the book, which is the first part for Yagyu. And it was his opinion uh, to a samurai as a Zen Buddhist monk who uh, dedicated his life to peace, to understanding, to questions, uh, to learning truth someone who had sworn an oath never to kill or to destroy, but to enlighten and to, to build and to foster. And unfortunately, a lot of people give Takuan uh, some heat in the, um, in the Buddhist circles, especially Zen Buddhist circles, saying that the way he refers to people in his work, the unfettered mind, is very unzen like it's, it's not in, teaching, in, in conformity with the teachings of the Buddha. Uh, in, in that he was giving advice on how he should uh, uh, tell his uh, samurai friend how best to use the sword and how best to kill and how to look at the enemy as an empty shell. Um, there, there was perhaps some, uh, I guess you'd say, basis for this, but for his advice to a friend, he is not writing it as though he would be a Zen master performing the arts of war. He is telling his friend, who is a master of the arts of war, how he can incorporate the Zen mind into his craft, into his thoughtful labor. And I think that's more important. Uh, but in any event, uh, that was the legacy that Takawan left. 
and he is very considered a, a central figure in Zen Buddhism uh, in this period uh, in uh, feudal Japan and uh, was well loved by uh, people today uh, for his writings, The Unfettered Mind, uh, as well as he was uh, in his day. So let's read uh, a couple passages from The Unfettered Mind and we'll talk about them. And again, I will put the, the read along so that you can follow as I read. So we'll begin with, um, as I said, this is Immovable Wisdom, and this will be on page 21. I'm sorry, we'll begin on page 4 and 5. <laughs> 21 will be the next reading. He begins, In Zen, this is called grabbing the spear, and contrarywise, piercing the man who had come to pierce you. The spear is a weapon. The heart of this is that the sword you wrest from your adversary becomes the sword that cuts him down. This is what you, in your style, call no sword. The mind can be taken by the sword. If you put your mind in the rhythm of the contest, your mind can be taken by that as well. If you place your mind in your own sword, your mind can be taken by your own sword. Your mind stopping at any of these places, you become an empty shell. In Buddhism, we call this stopping of the mind delusion. Thus, we say the affliction of abiding in ignorance. Immovable means unmoving. Wisdom means the wisdom of intelligence. Although wisdom is called immovable, this does not signify any insentient thing, like wood or stone. It moves as the mind is wont to move, forward or back, to the left, to the right, in ten directions, and to the eight points. And the mind that does not stop at all is called immovable wisdom. Okay, so that was a bit of a, uh, that was about three passages kind of spliced together as I, as I read them. But what he is saying there is that um, immovable wisdom is wisdom that does not cease moving. Um, it does not abide in one place. Uh, for the samurai, this is vital if he is to be successful in the martial arts. Uh, in the beginning uh, passage I read, he mentions the art uh, of no sword. So what he is telling Yagyu, which Yagyu is familiar with, is that in his discipline, uh, there, are two, there are two methods of warfare. There is one with weapons and there is one without weapons. Um, with weapons, obviously, he knows his friend Yagyu Munonori is a master swordsman. He's one of the most revered samurai uh, in uh, Japanese history as it came to the katana, the sword. But he also knew that Yagyu was practicing and teaching the art of no sword, which is uh, being approached by an opponent who is armed with a sword and being able to use his motion, his balance or imbalance, disarming him of his sword and then cutting him down with that same sword. This is the art of no sword, taking your enemy's weapon and using it against them. So this is difficult because if someone is a master of this sword, you too must be a master of the no sword if you hope to get that weapon away. And Yagyu uh, knew that uh, this, was, this was one of the most difficult things or positions to be in is a warrior left without his arms. And what his friend Takawan is saying in this passage is that the mind can be taken by the sword, the sword your opponent's holding. Your mind can be taken by the sword you're not holding. You focus on your hands. Uh, your mind can focus on your feet, your opponent's feet. Uh, but this is uh, the, the mind that has become stagnant. This is the mind that has decided to abide in one place. And he calls this uh, the delusion, the stopping of the mind in ignorance, to fix on one truth or to fix on one facet of what is going on in the world. He also mentions a, um, as an allegory, he speaks of as a tree. Uh, the, the mind that is brought to one place is the same as someone who looks upon a tree and focuses on one leaf. To him, the leaf appears clear, but the remainder of the tree and its leaves go out of focus. But the mind of immovable wisdom will look at the tree as a whole and see many leaves as well as the trunk and the branches. This is how you must be 
if you are to be a successful samurai. You must look at the entirety of the tree. You must not let your mind focus in on one individual leaf or your mind will stop. And if your mind ceases in the place it currently came to focus upon, it will not be able to anticipate the next motion or the motion after that. And this mind of never abiding, never resting, constantly in flow is, is immovable wisdom. If your mind is constantly looking towards the next step and then never resting at that next step, you will have this wisdom and you will be a successful warrior. And that was what he was trying to tell Yagyu uh, was that for the art of no sword, you cannot afford the abiding place. You cannot afford this place of rest where your mind can focus on one truth and neglect all the others. Your mind must constantly be moving from one truth to the next if you hope to survive. Right. This is a recurring theme in Takwan's work as well, which is immovable wisdom. So next we move to page 21. As I said earlier, this is now the reading. Um, and he says, In not remaining in one place, the right mind is like water. The confused mind is like ice, and ice is unable to wash hands or head. When ice is melted, it becomes water and flows everywhere, and it can wash the hands, the feet, or anything else. If the mind congeals in one place and remains with one thing, it is like frozen water and is unable to be used freely, ice that can wash neither hands nor feet. When the mind is melted and used like water, extending throughout the body, it can be sent wherever one wants to send it. This is the right mind. So like he was saying uh, in regards to immovable wisdom, the mind of the right the might, the might, the, I'm sorry, the, the right mind is the mind that is free like water. The confused mind is captured like ice. Ice can do essentially one or two things. Uh, it can be in the way, like a, a block of ice, and it can cool things. But water can do many things. Water can be concentrated in a stream, and it can crush that ice. Uh, water can be used softly to clean and wash and flow. Uh, water can also be used to uh, give life to plants. Uh, it has many other uses because it has this free form, this free state. So what he is saying is the right mind that is like water can be sent out to the limbs and this can enable the warrior to be more efficient and to never find that abiding place. Whereas the confused warrior will have the confused mind of ice and they will be stuck rigidly in this state, unable to function. And you can say this is akin to the person who is uh, the deer in the headlights, right? Uh, you know, when, in, when uh, hostility comes and action uh, is necessary, you have the right mind who is the person who is constantly evaluating things going on and never letting himself come to rest uh, while there is conflict around him. But the abiding mind, the deer in the headlights, sees what is going on and can't bring himself to any other action because his mind has become confused in that ice-like state. And that is what Takawan was referring to with the confused in the right mind, with the ice and the water. And that was, that was the analogy he was using to convey to Yagi that immovable wisdom will be like water. The confused mind, the ignorant mind, will stay sol solid as ice. Okay. We move to another reading here. This will be on page 28. And he says, If we put this in terms of your own martial art, the mind is not detained by the hand that brandishes the sword. Completely oblivious to the hand that wields the sword, one strikes and cuts his opponent down. He does not put his mind in his adversary. The opponent is emptiness. I am emptiness. The hand that holds the sword, the sword itself, is emptiness. Understand this, but do not let your mind be taken by emptiness. Okay, this one's good. So, as I said before, uh, Takawan Soho, um, historically, after his death, was uh, not, I wouldn't say ostracized or cast out by the Zen Buddhist philosophers, but he was... Uh, admonished uh, for taking this stance uh, that a person, a human being, 
such as Yagyu, could look at himself or another human being as empty, as a shell. And this is what he's referring to in this passage, was that to be an effective warrior, you have to assume as though you are emptiness. There is no form to you. There is no form to your opponent. The hand that holds the sword is not bound by the sword. The sword that is held by the hand is not bound by the hand. It is all empty. These are all things that are in control of the mind. The mind is what must not become empty. But it must regard everything else around it as apparitions, as figments of its own imagination, as in not really there and not bound by the laws of physics or anything else that may encumber it or force it to move or force it to stay in place. The mind must be the only mechanism that moves the other blocks of things that are within its control. And this emptiness is, uh, uh, this illusion of emptiness is also referenced by uh, Miyamoto Musashi, who I'll cover in the last part of the Samurai Lit series, where he says, as a warrior, you must fight as though you are already um, dead. You must presume as though you have died in this conflict and move yourself back into your shell with a mind that this shell is already cut down and discarded with. That is how you must fight. You must assume as though you will not survive this. You must assume as though your opponent is not going to survive this either. Once you give that up and once you assume the emptiness of death, but never let your mind abide in that place, you can become clear. You can, you can move yourself in combat with your arms and proceed as though the immovable wisdom of your mind will not ever rest because if all these assumptions are made that everything is lost and the shells are empty, you have nothing to lose or gain at this point. And that was what Takon was saying, was that the emptiness that is the sword, the body, the opponent's sword, the opponent's body, uh, these are meaningless things. But the mind is what must not abide in that emptiness. It must move these shells as it sees fit to be an efficient bushi, to be, to be a, a righteous samurai. Okay, last one. And we'll go to page 34. And he begins... Total loyalty is, making, is first in making your mind correct, disciplining your body, not splitting your thoughts, concerning your Lord by even a hair's breadth, and in neither resenting nor blaming others. Do not be neglectful of your daily work. At home, be filial. Let nothing indecent occur between husband and wife. Be correct in formality. Do not love mistresses. Sever yourself from the path of sensuality. Be austere as a parent and act according to the way. In employing underlings, do not make distinctions on the basis of personal feeling. Employ men who are good and bind them to you. Reflect on your own deficiencies. Conduct the government of your province correctly and put men who are not good at a distance. In this way, good men will advance daily, and those who are not will naturally be influenced when they see their Lord loving the good. Thus they will leave off evil and turn toward the good themselves. In this way, both Lord and retainer Upper and lower will be good men. And when personal desire becomes thin and pride is abandoned, the province's wealth will be plenty. The people will be held well ruled. Children will commune with their parents and superior and menial work together as hands and feet. The province should then become peaceful on its own. This is the beginning of loyalty. And as he concludes, this is something that nobody knows. From some offbeat inclination, one may be pulled along into bad habits and fall into evil. While you may think that no one knows about these faults, as there is nothing as clear as that which is dimly seen, if they are known in your mind, they will also be known by heaven, earth, the gods, and the people. If such is the case, is the protection of the province not truly in danger? You should recognize this as great disloyalty. Okay. So what is he saying in these two passages? Well, if we go back to the uh, first part of the uh, Samurai Lit Primer series, we talk about the eight virtues of the Samurai in Bushido. And among those um, virtues was duty. 
which you could also presume in duty you have loyalty. And he says in all of those recommendations, this is the beginning of loyalty. Your duty begins with yourself in making yourself clear conscience, in making yourself a upright and reliable man, a good samurai who follows Bushido and who does these things, but his point of origin is his own mind, is his own conscience. As in, if everything is empty and a shell, but the mind is what controls these shells and is immovable in its wisdom, uh, that is also where loyalty and duty begins. And if he can at least retreat back into that self-consciousness, he can right himself and rule the province uh, justly. And he will show men that this is how a samurai must behave and they will take reflection in their own lives and look to do the good that the master of the province um, himself practices. And the disloyalty comes from when he gives these things up. Because even if he is uh, careful to look after his own virtues and his own life, but not so careful as to follow them to the letter, he says nothing is so uh, uh, clearly seen as that which is dim. And that in these small and in these minor infractions of, on virtue, uh, they will be seen as though he does not particularly care about them enough to look after these small disloyalties. And these will in turn become great disloyalties to his Lord, to his people, to his family, uh, and it will make him stray from uh, the way of the warrior. This will not be good Bushido. If he allows these small infractions to become uh, major disloyalties to himself. Uh, so those were the first few readings of Takawan Soho's uh, Unfettered Mind chapter on immovable wisdom and how the Zen Buddhist monk uh, would advise his samurai friend Yagyu Munonori to approach his craft, uh, to look after his art, and how the presence of mind, the uh, immovable nature of wisdom, uh, as, a, as, a, as a Buddhist practice it's, practices it, can also be utilized by a samurai uh, as he approaches combat or his day-to-day -day ministerial work uh, and the virtues um, that he uses as his life's instructions on how to be a better version of the samurai he was the day before. Right. Okay. So this is uh, the conclusion of Takawan Soho Part 1. We'll pick up with Part 2. I'll probably do one more reading from Immovable Wisdom because it's such a great chapter. But then we'll move on to the clear sound of jewels and the annals of sword tie. Um, so uh, once again, I appreciate you coming by uh, and giving this one a, a watch. Although it may have been a little longer than uh, previous uh, videos, but I appreciate you uh, staying through all the same. Uh, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. If uh, you're liking the channel overall, please subscribe and share. And we will see you in uh, part two for Taco on Soho. Till then, take care.